No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news, no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Jim Dearman, your host for this edition of Good News Today, and we're so glad that you have joined us. As always, we want to tell you what's coming your way on this edition of our program. Of course, as always, we begin with our devotional time, which consists of our scripture reading, beautiful singing, and then a brief study of our scripture. Today, we go to the epistle of Paul to Titus, and we're going to look at a very familiar text, I'm sure, to many of our uh, audience members. It's Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. So get your Bibles and be turning to Titus 2, 11 through 14. We'll be reading together there in just a moment after I tell you what else is coming your way on today's program. Following the uh, devotional time, Cody Boston is back with us for another Cody's Corner segment. And today, Cody will be talking about shields, but he'll talk about specifically the most important shield, and that is the shield of faith. It's a great segment, as always, and you will not want to miss that. And Mark Teske, our co-producer and co-host of, uh, of Good News Today, is here with a Something to Share segment as he talks about life-changing Scripture. In other words, Scripture is designed to be life-changing. Is it life-changing to you? Some very uh, good thoughts coming your way, as always, from Mark Teske. And then our final segment, Have a Bible Question with Guy Montgomery and Troy Spradlin. Why did God call David a man after God's own heart? They have an excellent explanation from Scripture, as always, uh, for that uh, uh, designation that uh, was given to David, the man after God's own heart. Why did God call him the man after God's own heart? You will not want to miss that. So that's a brief preview, and uh, we are so glad that you have come our way. We hope you have your Bibles open now to Titus chapter 2, and you're ready to read along with us and then study along with us for a few moments from Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. It reads, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And we are back for the study portion of our devotional time. And we hope you have your Bible still opened to Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. A great text on the subject of the grace of God and specifically how it is that we accept that grace. You know, there are those who erroneously contend that 
salvation is by grace alone, that there's nothing that we need to do, that God's grace will take care of, uh, of everything, nothing for man to do. Then there are many more who claim, uh, also erroneously, however, that it's uh, grace through faith alone. That is, it is by our mental agreement, our acceptance of Christ in our hearts without any actual obedience being necessary, that that, that is the way by which we appropriate the grace of God. But we're going to see from this text, a text which is obviously consistent with every other scripture, that grace came teaching us something and teaching us how to respond to God's grace. So go back with me now to verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Now there's our first point, and that is the appearance of grace. The grace of God has appeared to all men. In other words, it is God's desire that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's 1 Timothy 2, verse, uh, verse 4. And so, obviously, God's grace is available to all men because God is a gracious God. He is a good God, perfect in goodness, perfect in, in every uh, characteristic. And so, the grace of God is there, but obviously, the grace of God has to be appropriated in some way. Now, the universalists would say, no, that's not the case. But here's a passage that obviously and immediately denies any idea of salvation by grace alone, because Paul affirms by inspiration, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. But here's our next point. The acceptance of grace is seen beginning in verse 12. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us. It came teaching. The grace of God came with teaching. Teaching us what, Paul? That denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, as the New King James renders that text. So obviously, the grace of God came with stipulations. In other words, it's not grace alone that saves, but grace came teaching us that we have a response to make to the grace of God. Let me take a little side trip and go back to something that's pertinent to our discussion here, and that is the first time that the word grace appeared in Scripture. And we've talked about this before. It's in reference to Noah. And it goes all the way back to Genesis 6, verse 8 where God in that context is speaking of destroying mankind because of the great wickedness of man. But, but Noah found grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's the first time we find the word grace used in Scripture. That's Genesis 6, 8. But verse 9 tells us the basis upon which Noah received the grace of God. Noah was a just man perfect or upright in his generations. Noah walked with God. You see, the first time the word grace is used and we're introduced to it, we also see a principle established there that never changed. Oh yes, we've talked about the particulars of accepting God's grace have changed under the new covenant. Noah had to build an ark and be obedient to God in that respect. But we're not told to build an ark to accept the grace of God uh, today. But Noah had to be obedient to the commands that God gave him. We must be obedient to the commands that God through Christ and his New Testament has given to us. Noah was a just man, perfect or upright. He wasn't sinless, but he was perfect, and upright, blameless, upright, perfect in his generations. Here's the key phrase, Noah walked with God. What does it mean to walk with God? It means to do what God has said. So now we come to grace under the New Testament. Has the principle changed at all? Absolutely not. The grace of God has appeared to all men, Paul tells us, but it came what? Teaching us that we have a response to make. The appearance of grace and then the acceptance of grace. We're to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. In fact, we can stay right here in Titus and we can see how it is summarized in terms of the response that we are to make to the grace of God. Read with me from Titus chapter 3, uh, verses 4 through 7. 
For, or but when the great, when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, there it is, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. What does Paul say in chapter 3 of Titus that we, that, that justified us? How were we justified by His grace? Through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the teaching of the Holy Spirit. By following the teachings of the Holy Spirit that the Spirit has revealed in His Word, and the washing of regeneration is a clear reference to baptism. No Bible student or scholar worth his salt would ever deny that that is anything but a reference to baptism the burial in water where the blood of Jesus is applied. So it was not by works of righteousness which we have done. Is Paul eliminating all works when he says not by works of righteousness which we have done, Titus 3, 5? No, he's talking about we couldn't earn by any works that we devised. We could not earn our salvation. But does that eliminate all works of every kind? As we have often said, no indeed, it does not. So we continue back to Titus 2, 11 through 14. The appearance of grace, verse 11. The acceptance of grace, verse 12, reinforced by Titus 3, 4 through 7. But verse 13 gives us the anticipation of grace. Listen to it. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's the anticipation of grace that we're going to need when the Lord comes again. Will it be salvation by grace alone when the Lord comes again, by which we are saved? No, but we must be obedient. And when we are obedient to the terms of the gospel, obeying it initially by hearing it, believing that Jesus is the Christ, repenting of sins, confessing Jesus to be the Christ, and being buried in baptism for the remission of sins, then we have accepted the grace of God by our obedient faith, and we are added to His church, the kingdom of God. But as we live faithfully the Christian life, we still must rely ultimately on the salvation that comes ultimately by God's grace because we can't earn our salvation. Listen to 1 Peter 1, verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Will we need grace when He comes again? Yes, because we can't be sinless, just as we need grace now. But listen to verse 14. After He says, rest your hope fully upon grace when He comes again, verse 14 continues, as obedient children. Who is it that can rely on the grace of God when the Lord returns? His obedient children. Have they earned salvation? By their works? No. But are there works that are absolutely essential to our salvation? Yes, indeed. And that involves the activity of grace. Verse 14, listen to it. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all or every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. Listen to it. Zealous for good works. Good works, works by which we show our faith, are absolutely essential. So what have we seen in Titus 2, 11 through 14? The appearance of grace to all men, verse 11. The acceptance of grace by obedience to the terms of the New Covenant, the New Testament. The anticipation of grace as we look for His second coming. And the activity of grace while we wait for that second coming. We must be active in every good work. Read one more verse, verse 1 of chapter 3. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. Can we be saved without works of obedient faith? No, but we can't earn our salvation by works by which we devise. We must make that distinction. Well, our time is gone for our devotional time. Time now for Cody Boston to tell us more about the shield of faith. Ties right in with what we've been saying. Here's Cody. Welcome to Cody's Corner. Today, I want to talk about shields for just a moment. And specifically, the shields that we think of when we think of Roman soldiers and, and those 
in the first century and in that time frame, the kind of shields they would have had. You see, when you think of a shield back then, it's not the circular shield like a frisbee looking type shield that you would hold, but rather it's the shields that were like doors, like full length of the body type of shield for protection. And it would obviously the arrows coming in and things of that nature, you could protect yourself with a shield like that. And as I think of that type of shield, that would have been what would be on the minds of the Ephesians when Paul wrote to them and told them to take this shield of faith. If you look at Ephesians chapter 6, and we see in verse 16, Above all, taking the shield of faith with you, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the, the wicked one taking this shield of faith with you that you can use to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Shield of faith. When they would hear the word shield, their mind wouldn't go to the small dinky type shields, but their mind would go to those massive shields that would protect your full body. Take that shield for protection. You know, as I think of this shield of faith, I'm reminded of different parts of Scripture that talk about faith and God being a shield for us uh, because of our faith. First, the Bible tells us in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of God, whether you literally are hearing the Word of God, whether you are reading the Word of God, and thus that's the way you're hearing it. But the more that you read, the stronger your faith grows. The experiences you have every day where your faith is tested, through that testing of your faith, the stronger your faith grows. But ultimately, as we think of shield of faith, it's our faith in God, and God, as a result of our faith, acts as a shield. Look at the psalmist and his words in Psalm 18 and verse number 30. Psalm 18 and verse 30. As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. The stronger our faith grows in God, the more we learn to trust in Him. And as we learn to trust in Him deeper and more completely, He is a shield for us as those fiery darts are coming our way. So each and every day that you and I are blessed to to serve, wake up and to experience, may we allow that day to be an opportunity to fully trust in God with all of our hearts, knowing that He is acting as a shield for us to help protect us. So don't forget your shield of faith as you go about your day today. Well, that's it for my corner of the world. I hope that you have a blessed day. Great segment as always from Cody Boston, the shield of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, and that Word is life-changing. And coming up after a brief break, Mark Teske will be here to talk about that life-changing Scripture. We'll be right back. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today. P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. Again, that's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free at one 877 Three eight four seven two two one. That's one eight seven seven three eight four seven two two one. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our audience is always good news to us. We hope you take advantage of that contact information. Visit our website at gnttv.org. And we'd love to have you enroll in our Bible correspondence course, as literally hundreds of people have done. It's absolutely free, no obligation. We'd love to hear from you. Take advantage of that contact information. Right now, take advantage of another excellent Something to Share segment. Here's Mark Teske. Hello, friend. I've got something I'd like to share with you. When you open up your Bible... Is it a life-changing experience? 
I'm not trying to be cute or dramatic, but want us to consider this question very seriously. Let's listen to the words of James, who is inspired to write, Be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself and goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does. If you just read the Bible and don't change your life, James tells us you're deceiving yourself. You've got to put these things into action. If your response to God's Word doesn't change anything, you're not allowing the Word of God to do what it's intended to do. Scripture is intended to change lives. And if opening up your Bible isn't a life-changing experience, you need to approach your Bible differently. Put Scripture into action in your life. And then you can share this with someone else. Excellent thoughts on life-changing Scripture from our co-producer and co-host of Good News Today, Mark Teske. Coming up, our final segment, it's Have a Bible Question, right after another brief break. Why did God call David a man after God's own heart? That's a question with which uh, Guyton Montgomery and Troy Spradlin are dealing today, and they will, as always, deal with it from the Word of God. Here they are. All right, Troy, you're a Texas boy, right? I am a Texas boy, yes, sir. What's the most Texas Southern saying you can think of? (laughs) Y'all. We say y'all in Texas. (laughs) All right, uh, here's the Southern saying, I thought, bless his heart. That's true. We do say that, too. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> kind of leads us to today's question, and it says, why did God call David a man after God's own heart? And this is actually a reference to the New Testament in Acts chapter 13, verse 22. It says, "When and when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. And, and this is obviously an Old Testament passage or a reference to an Old Testament passage where you had the United Kingdom of Israel and the first king was actually Saul Mm -hmm. and Saul was one of those men he was big in stature he he Mm -hmm. was tall head and shoulders above other men and and he was very hesitant to take being king whenever Mm -hmm. Samuel first uh, appeared to him and God chose him but towards the end of his reign his arrogance Mm -hmm. and pride that's right uh, it really stood in the way and you come to a passage like first samuel chapter 13 verse 13 it says and samuel said to saul thou hast done foolishly thou hast not kept the commandment of the lord thy god which he commanded thee for now would the lord have established thy kingdom upon israel forever so this is saying i'm going to take the kingdom away from you but because of what you did it's not and so he goes on in verse 14 but now thy kingdom shall not continue the lord hath sought him a man after his own heart and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. So that's the idea that God was seeking a man after God's own heart. But why did he call David a man after God's own heart? 
Oh, that's a great question. You know, this is actually a question that has perplexed many people for many years, because when you think about why would he pick David? Because David sinned. David sinned several times. There were many things that are recorded in the scriptures where David didn't do right. Exactly. But God could see his heart. And you were in First Samuel, if you continue with that, and see where God took the kingdom from Saul and then is trying to get the new king. They're parading all of Jesse's sons, and, and here's somebody who's tall and handsome like Saul. And in chapter 16, verse 7, it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so God could clearly see the heart of David. So that reference in Acts chapter 13, you know, we, we have to take it for what it says. God was able to see his heart. He knows that it was a man after his own heart. Now, fortunately, we can also see a little bit of David's heart in the Psalms. Oh, yes. And that he, that he loved God, mm-hmm. um, that he loved God's creation. Yes. Uh, he loved God's people and took the responsibility seriously. And I would even say that he loved righteousness. Mm-hmm. That, that, no, he wasn't perfect. We know about the sin with Bathsheba. We know about maybe some failures as a father. Mm-hmm. But remember that heart in which he repented yeah. uh, as soon as he heard Nathan the prophet? Yes, exactly. And that's, I think that shows why. Uh, David is a man after God's own heart. So even through his sin, even through all the things that he did, he never lost his respect and his loyalty to God, wanting to be in that covenant relationship. You see that in Psalm 51, that beautiful Psalm about Lord, have mercy on me. According to your loving kindness, according to your multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. He says, create in me a clean heart later on in that Psalm. I mean, yeah. He's a man after God's own heart. And the lesson we need to take away from that is, just like David, we're not going to be perfect. That's right. But we need to have the heart that loves God, loves his word, loves his righteousness, and is willing to repent when we we err. Amen. Our thanks to Guyton and Troy, and our thanks to you for being with us for another edition of Good News Today. Don't forget to access the program in any number of ways. You can, of course, visit our website, gnttv.org. You can go to your appropriate app store and download the Good News Today app and see entire programs at your convenience, or the different segments are separated there, so that if you just got a few minutes, you can just... uh, Uh, watch or listen to a segment uh, uh, at your convenience as well. Also, truth.fm, we have our 24-7 internet radio station there. So many ways to access us. Thanks so much for being with us. Always good news, good news, good news. There is good news today. Good news, good news. Always good news, good news. Good news, there is good news today. All around the world, good news, good news, good news. always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today.